Hello, all you hardcore boxing fans out there. How are you doing? <clears throat> Big P here. You know, don't you? You know. I'm on an early morning one with the voice of pay-per-view boxing, Mr. Dale Nichols, a.k.a. The Man. How are you doing, Dale? Russ, I'm on top of the world, I bet you. Top of the world, Mark. Yeah, I'm all right. I'm, uh, I'm just recovering from a heavy session. Uh, I'd normally be going to bed at this time now, but obviously I've got three videos to do today, nine o'clock, 11 o'clock and one o'clock on a Sunday. So we might as well get it out of the way. What did you think about the uh, Eddie Hills show Friday? Um, I'll be honest, I didn't watch it Friday night. Uh, I caught up on Saturday morning. Um, and, you know, true to form, it's been a pretty poor, poor few few uh, few months, hasn't it, for Hills? He's, he's really been struggling putting cards together. Um, there wasn't much on it at all. There was no depth to the card. But because at the top of the card, what we'd got was a world title fight. No matter how much of a mismatch it was, it could paper over any cracks, couldn't it? Um, I thought the main event itself for Billy Joe Saunders against Murray. It was nothing more than a procession. It was a sparring match on TV. Billy Joe Saunders, time and time again, stinks the place out. People can say, oh, you know, it was, a, it was a clever performance from Billy Joe. He's got the big fights lined up. But we've been hearing this for three, four, five years now, and he hasn't kicked on. You know, he, he's had, people say that Cush Eubank Jr. is uh, an inactive fighter, but he turned pro two and a half years later than Billy Joe, and he's had more pro fights than Billy Joe. So how does that one work? He really needs to kick on now. But in my opinion, I think he'll just have a cash out fight next year. It'll either be against probably the winner of Canelo against Smith, which I think will be Canelo anyway. Canelo will probably look to mop up the belts there. Yeah. Billy Joe's natural middleweight anyway, so he wouldn't pose sort of the same problems as what Smith would. Um, and he'd be pretty cheap labour, I would imagine. Anyway, just to get him over, I think he'd probably sell, sell the belt for a few million anyway. And then he'll just disappear off into the distance. Um, he's yeah. not going anywhere fast. Do you, you know, people say people say about Billy Joe Porky that he's this masterful boxer and that, you know, he could potentially be Britain's pain for pain number one. But as far as I'm concerned, the evidence before me is that his best win is still at British level. Yeah. Do you think that Billy, there's, there's always... More to come for Billy Joe. Do you think that we always seem to think the glasses are full with him? Uh, it could be that he has got more levels in him. It could be that he could go through the gears, no, you know, dependent on the opponent. But if you look at his two biggest fights, the Andy Lee fight, he won a majority decision and it was only the two knockdowns that won in the fight. Second half of the fight, Andy Lee pretty much was bouncing him round the ring for long parts of it. Same as Eubank Jr., I had Eubank Jr. winning that fight because I had him picking up a couple of the early rounds and there's no doubt that he won the last four or five. Um, again, that was a split decision. Um, I think Kev won sort of dying out on the Lemieux fight, but Lemieux was tying the mind for Billy Joe. If you he, know, it's a fight that he went out there and he won comfortably. Do you think, Dale, that Billy Joe's a 160 and not a 168? Definitely. Definitely, but I think he's suffering now with in the latter part of his career. I think he's probably struggling to make one six eight as it is. So he's not going to ever get back down to one sixty again, is he? You think Billy Joe's putting Canelo and Golovkin on notice? What do you think, Paul? Okay. Uh, it's hard, isn't it, to to give an opinion on Billy Joe because wherever I say, I get hammered, but. I think there's more to come from him and I think it's up to his trainer to get that out of him because if you're not stopping Martin Murray, and Martin Murray, Martin Murray don't forget, he weren't even throwing Murray. That's got to be the lowest punch output from any world title challenger over 12 rounds to ever fight, surely. Martin Murray weren't throwing punches and Billy couldn't get him out of there and it looked to me after that he gasped early, Bill, and waited for his second win. He just got through it, didn't he? You know, with his experience. And with Murray not having a, any vigour about him, you know, youth. 
it would have been an hard fight on that performance against Callum Smith coming in, uh, firing on all cylinders, wasn't it? Do you think? Oh, that that Billy Joe wouldn't have beat wouldn't have beat Saund, um Smith. It wouldn't have beat Smith at all. I mean, you know, you look through his career. I've met there's many people that think that John Ryder beat Saunders as well. All through his career, the big fights that he's had outside of the Lemieux fight, many people had Artur Akhavov beating him in Paisley Leisure Centre. There's so many question marks over his career results that I can't seem to take this guy seriously. People can tell me all they want that he's this masterful boxer and that he's got the potential to, to beat a Golovkin or he could beat a Canelo. But until I see it with before my eyes, I see a performance that tells me otherwise. I, I can only judge him on those performances. And to me, his best win, he's still at British level in a life and death against Eubank Jr., who was a novice at the time. He hadn't had anywhere near the same experience fights as Billy Joe. And I just I just think that he'd get blown out of there. He'd I get blown bank. out of there. By you, Bank. Do you think you will be as close? No, not by you, Bank. By Golovkin, by Golovkin or Canella. Or maybe Callum Smith, if Billy's not on his game. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'd probably, I would back Smith to beat, to beat Saunders. On that performance last night, on, on Friday's performance, you mean? Just throughout his career, just from the, the performances that I've mentioned, that he can potentially raise his game, but I just wouldn't put him into that, you know, world, world-class world class elite. Yeah, I, I don't know where to sort of put Billy Joe for me. I don't know where to put him because look at his last, you know, his last three years as a, as a pro. You've got, uh, obviously, you've got Martin Murray now, but you've got Martin Kokoris last year on the YouTubers undercard where he had to come from behind and win by stoppage. Um, you've got Charles Adamu and you've got, and you've got Shefford as Sufu in three years, in his prime years. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what to say about Billy, to be honest. He, what, he got the win... And he's been out at ring a year, right? So that's the positive. He's 30 and 0 now. 14 knockouts. That's another positive. But is 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 his career ju- just about staying undefeated now and fighting once a year? I mean, we're talking about a guy here that won the world title five years ago now against Andy Lee, and these are his peak years. And do you think he might have hit the top now and he's just coming down and he's missed his peak, he's, he's gone by his peak with inactivity? Or do you think there's more to come and it's just a case of him being active? I think he, I think his peak years are behind him. And he, and like I say, I think he will look to cash out next year. I think he, he, he's sort of... The way the, the landscape is now between, you know, middleweight, super middleweight, it's kind of, you know, you wind the clock back about eight, nine years... The two cash cows. You've got you've got the, you know the gold star cash cow in what Mayweather was, and then you've got like the secondary cash cow in in what Pacquiao was, and it's kind of like that now in the middleweight division, super middleweight division. You've got the gold star cash cow in Canelo, and the secondary one is Golovkin, yeah. and he's kind of targeting Golovkin because he can't be calling out Canelo because he's fighting. Not stable, mate, but he's you know someone from his fellow promotional company, so he can't be seen to make be making out Canelo to be a ducker. So the only other target is Golovkin. So that's why they're using Golovkin's name this weekend. Yet yeah, all we've heard out of Billy Joe for the past six twelve months is Canelo. He'll not want to go near Golovkin now. They want they want another fight. Sure, they want Gol- to have another fight. You know, like a Jacobs or something like that, or. A- I mean, does Billy Joe beat John Ryder on that performance Friday? Well, again, that seems, you know, there's, there's rumours that he's going to be fighting for the vacant uh, regular belt in, uh, yeah. against Chudinov. That's an hard fight for John Ryder, that. That's a fight I think John Ryder could win. But again, I, I feel sorry for John Ryder because he gave the performance of his life 13 months ago. Um, I wouldn't say he was robbed, 
because it, to me it was a very very close fight that could have gone either way but he deserved a big opportunity off the back of that and although we've had the pandemic etc you've you've not seen him even mentioned in the same breath have you as, as you know potentially getting a smith rematch or even getting a crack at saunders why couldn't he have been in there with saunders on friday night instead of martin murray i mean we have, we have to look at it from both sides i know Aussies a big John Ryder fan and he's got John Ryder winning that fight and it was a very close fight but you got to look at Callum Smith right he's, he's another one that's just never really been in trouble Billy's been in more trouble than Callum in fights due to his fitness I think mainly and in the Eubank fight and the Akatov fight that, that were close because of Bill's fitness wasn't it but Callum Smith's done it t- ticked every box what is he 27 and 0 you know, Not sure on his record. 27 and 0, Callum Smith. But I just think that on that performance, Callum Smith and Billy Joe is an hard fight for Billy Joe. But Billy Joe might need another camp to click for it all to click. But we've been saying this. It's oh, it, we keep going back to David Lemieux uh, fight. But David Lemieux would take the made for Bill, but he, he did school him. But Three year is a long time in boxing, isn't it? and when he gets in ring again, it'll be three and a half years since the little meal fight. Are we going to keep harking back to 2017 when we're in 2021 next? We're going to keep saying, Oh, he boxed great against the meal. That's gone, isn't it? That now, do you mind three and a half years being a long time in boxing? Three and a half months a long time in boxing if you don't take care of yourself. And I think them chickens came home to roost. And he just did enough, as he always does, to get through. And he got the win. He won every round, which we said had happened, didn't we? Martin Murray's got to hang, hang his gloves up. But I don't want to hear people like Adam Smith going on about durable. When they're saying durable and game and teak tough and rough tough and all this rugged and all action and great family man, and all the, the winding lad's career down, as they say, aren't they? How many times do we hear them say, Dave Allen's game and he's really up for this? It means they're going to get beat, doesn't it, these people, doesn't it? You know, when they're in the ring. Yeah, they're just there as an opponent. They're not trying to narrate the story. As soon as they wheeled Martin Murray out and Adam Swift kept saying, great family man. Oh, isn't a great family man? Everybody loves their families, don't they? But they're talking about it like everybody else in the world hates the kids except them. Do you know what I mean? Do you see where I'm coming from? Yeah. I don't want to hear about stuff like that. I want Adam Smith to shut his pie hole when he's commentating. I want him to shut his cake and just let, let the action... Carry on. You go watching that Larry Holmes fight in the 70s and 80s. You don't hardly get anybody go, going off like he does. You know, beat. He makes it about him, doesn't he? But Martin Murray, he, he were he was shot a few years ago, wasn't he, really? He was finished a few years ago. Fair enough. You know, he made the weight. But he, he were never going to do anything, was he, really? And if that's the best that they can offer... I think that's shocking from Sky that to wheel Martin Murray out like that. Shocking. It's and pretty poor. I think if you if looking at the super middleweight scene now, compared to obviously what it was during the Super Six and all that. I mean, can you imagine this Saunders in there with Frotch? Do you know the Frotch who beat Damon Egg when he won British title, right? That Carl Frotch, uh, it won British title and defending it outright. Frotch would have run over Saunders and Murray last night if he'd have fought either of them. Uh, he's British when he were British level, he would have run over them. But that British level compared to today's British level, it's worlds apart in it now. Look at the world level guys we've got now, and look at what Frotch when he were British level. Could you imagine him with Murray, Martin Murray last night? What would have happened? <laughs> he got eaten alive. Got eaten alive. So could you imagine the frotch who did Groves in with them last night? It'd have been a bloodbath, wouldn't it? Yeah. It'd have just run over them. You wouldn't have been talking about skills and this and that, but but it'd have just run over them like you would have done to Gale. But uh I don't know. Is the standard slipping? No, because Billy Billy Joe Saunders, he, he, he is what Mark Tibbs says, a boxing genius, but He's got to come up with something better than that. If you can't stop Martin Murray, who's not throwing punches, 
what chance are you going to have against Callum Smith or Canelo or Golovkin? Yeah, I think I was going to say, I, I, you know, it'd be good to see Billy Joe back out in the, in the early part of next year. Back to back camps, it could be good for him. But with Christmas now, can you trust Billy Joe to keep his discipline and not pile on best part of two to three stone? Because I don't. No, but he might surprise us all and get you a knuckle down. But we, we might not see Billy Joe in the ring again. Or we might see him in April. Who knows? But I want to see him fight Canelo. But he, he can't wait it out with Canelo with his age because he's younger than Billy. So he can't wait that one out. Golovkin, he could wait that out maybe another year and fight Golovkin because he'll be, he'll be nearly 40 then, won't he? Golovkin, he must be knocking on now. Yeah, he's getting on, yeah. John Ryder, there's there's fights that can be made. Saunders, Ryder 2, right? Saunders, Eubank 2. Saunders, Callum Smith, that's three fights there. Uh, Callum Johnson says he'll come down to 168 for the right fight. Callum Johnson against Billy Joe for WBO belt because Callum Johnson's like the bogeyman, isn't he, that nobody wants to go near. I'll ask you a question there, Porky Rod. Outside of a Joshua fight, yeah, is there a bigger fight in British boxing that than Saunders Eubank too? No, I don't think there is. Maybe no. that's a humongous know. fight. That is. Well, maybe maybe Callum Smith Saunders. That's a big fight. <sighs> but Saunders Eubank too has got added spice, hasn't it? <laughs> I mean, that's just a humongous fight. Sizzling. <laughs> Sizzling. Yeah. Um, okay, so we've covered off Billy Joe. Uh, what else did we have? Oh, oh. I think we've already called Weapon of the Week as well, Porky. Johnny Nelson. Yeah, Johnny Nelson's probably looking looking. Uh... Close to being a weapon when I when when I get to office Monday, I think that uh, it could be Johnny Nelson. Yeah, it could be. Could I, could I, can I just read a few uh, a few quotes out to you from, uh, from our Johnny? Go on, let's. So we've got um, we've got if Mayweather McGregor comes down to fitness, yeah. McGregor's going to win. God. Um, on Carlos Tacker, you've got. Tackham is Evander Oldfield and George Foreman rolled into one and he's going to give Joshua nightmares. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, you've got uh, <clears throat> Usyk, Bellew. You've got Bellew. He's technically better than Usyk. Kelbrook against... Kelbrook's going to school Golovkin. Yeah. And what about Khan Canelo? He said Khan he beats Canelo, didn't he? Yep, he did. So, what what's the latest edition then this week? Johnny Nelson says that James Tennyson ices Tank Davis because he's an ice man. <laughs> James Tennyson. I mean, Johnny's got to be trolling some of these stuff he comes out with. They must just do it for a reaction. He must go home, right, and just laugh his head off knowing that he's stirring pot, saying these things. It's either that which, in my opinion, if it is, it's incompetence. Or he actually he means it, which, mean, which means he doesn't know anything about boxing. So for that, Johnny Nelson, you've got to resign from, from uh, Sky. You've got, to, you've got to resign, Johnny, and uh, Andy P45. And, and, and get your P45, Johnny, and get out of Dodge, because... Shocking, shocking, but it's still show again, didn't it, Johnny? With that, George well, it's Carl, given, it's, yeah. It, it, I mean, it's it, it, look it's, shocked, just, it? it's just turning into like a panel show now of who can come out with the stupidest comment every week between yeah. Bell, you, Macklin, and, and Nelson. And who can come out with the most stupid comment? What's to what's what's Tony, uh. Bell, you've been saying this week, Tony's world. Welcome to Tony's world. Well, I don't know. He's disappeared, hasn't he? Has Off he... the face of the earth. What I was noticing the other day, and I was having a little look, 
Anthony Joshua up at the EIS, he's a, he manages fighters now, doesn't he? Coley, Boatsy, I think he's another kid he's, he's signing as well. The Billy Joe Saunders manages Don, Deontay Dixon and another kid. Bellew, he, he manages a few fighters. So does Dylan White. All these people now, these fighters are signing with these matchroom fighters, like them four I've just mentioned, and they're getting slots. So Eddie didn't, didn't need to mess about signing anybody on managers deals when he knows that he can get his fighters to go sign people and do the, do the job for him because they want to keep Eddie sweet. So they know that they're going to get dates for themselves in the ring or around the ring as pundits, as in Bellew. And Eddie knows that they're loyal men. So they, they're managing fighters and they're just giving them to Eddie. And it's, it saves Eddie wasting energy, doesn't it? It's to do a job for him. You see where I'm coming from? Yeah. There is go to guys to put shows on now. Throw Colwell into the mix, but he's a trainer, isn't he, Dave Colwell? We can't say he's a bad trainer, right? Because he's he, he's won titles, hasn't he? But it's now becoming a cult. It's a cult, and it's controlled by Ed, Edward Hills, Edward John Hills, four and oh, super heavyweight amateur star from Billy Ricky, three by way of. Eddie Show Hills. us the records. I wonder it's... if Eddie Hearn, with his 75% KO ratio, were a pressure fighter or if he were a, a box-to-box fighter or if he were, a, you know, a, a mover, you know, a, you know, a, a back foot fighter. Because we haven't seen any footage, have we, yet? We're still... Eddie, come see me with your footage. So... Bricktop should say show us the records. Yeah, Bricktop has. Bricktop said. Get the records out. They tr- they had uh, some hist- historian checking up on it, didn't it? It didn't happen, wouldn't happen, never happened. But what happens when you tell a massive lie? You have to do two things. You've got to shut it down or you've got to keep telling more. more. And it's a whopper from Edward Hills, that, isn't it? Free by way of. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's on his back about it there. And it's building momentum as well, which I'm loving. We are. I'm lucky to see. It's building momentum now, isn't it? This Eddie Hills. Eddie Hills, yeah. It's, it'll be no context hills soon, won't it? <laughs> <laughs> We're sorry, really, but what can we do? Are we? Are we? Uh, are we? Are we going to put up with it though for any much longer? What's What's going on? Because it's starting to be WWE in it now. We've got eras where nobody's fighting each other, and he's got all the fighters. I mean, all these super middles and the can't make fights. I mean, what's up with Andrade? Why don't they put Andrade in We uh, somebody, John Ryder, Saunders, some of them, Eubank. I mean, in Eddie Hill's right-hand man, going to marry Eubank's sister. So surely they can get Eubank on to bring him to the table, can't they? You'd imagine so, yeah, but he's never sort of been dictated to as a Eubank all throughout his career and there's, there's fighters that, that Hills sort of, he doesn't like give them much praise or, or sort of mention them too much because there's, 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 there's two fighters that sort of spring to mind for me that Eddie Hills is absolutely desperate to work with. And these are because they're potential pay-per-view stars. One of them is a massive pay-per-view star. One of them's Tyson Fury and the other one is Chris Eubank Jr. These are fighters that Hills would take a can dick up his arse for. To get him to get him when he's stable, probably like that, Eddie. Yeah, uh, well, Tyson Fury is he's he's the man in here heavyweight. We know that, don't we? He's the number one, and he, he'd be an attraction for Eddie Earn to sign. Would it go down well with Femi? I don't know, but uh, we'll have to watch it all unfold. Moving on, then, Dale. So we've covered that fight. What about Shannon Courtney? What what's happening with her? She won, didn't she? I mean, I just don't get it. I just don't get it at all. It's She's fought an absolute pack of stiffs. Most of the people that she's fought have turned up in their fucking PE kit. She's got this multi-fucking-whatever deal with Adidas now. 
And again, she's a classic example with what is wrong with boxing these days. And it's all about profile and all about a following and not enough about talent and raw talent and hard work and dedication. Now, I ain't saying that she doesn't go in the gym every single day and work her nuts off. She Clearly, clearly she does. But if it's coming down to talent, Paul, okay, right, she's just been beat by what would be in the, the equivalent in the men's game of a British level fight. Probably not even that, probably, probably an English level fight. And she just got beat at that level. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, but the hype that's surrounding her and the way that she's being pushed, it just doesn't warrant what we're seeing before our eyes. And that she clearly what they were aiming to do was she was supposed to beat this Rachel Ball, then she was supposed to fight this Ebony Bridges who's beat three people all with losing records. One of them was a, deb a debutant and supposed to fight her for a bloody, for the Instagram championship of the world, I think. It's, it's a piss take, Porky. It's and these are taking up slots on shows that could be filled by good, genuine lads. Now, I know through this pandemic, there's been fighters that have got the opportunities. A lot of local fighters from around by me, especially through BCB promotions, have got opportunities on TV that never normally would. And it's been great to see. Warren's probably given more of these opportunities because he doesn't just force it with women's title fights and women's boxing. Because a lot of these people, a lot, a, a lot of these bloody women that are propping up on these shows, it's only because they've got an Instagram or a Twitter following. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's hard, isn't it? But she does put the effort in. You've got to get, get, give her a, a, a credit. And she is getting in the ring. And she's not going to knock a deal back if Adidas are going to put money on the table. But I see where you're coming from, that there's other fighters that are female that are maybe more deserving that, for that uh, contract with a sports company. But maybe they don't think that other fighters like Savannah Marshall, Shannon Courtney, who've got world titles, Terry Harper, who's got a world title, maybe Adidas don't think that they've got as good a personality as Shannon, even though they might be better fighters. Do you see where I'm coming from? Well, yeah, obviously, I think also image probably comes into it. There's no probably a bear. Oh, that's right. She's, she, she's a, if you put her next to Rachel Ball, who beat her, right, who would you give a contract to, though, for, for a sportswear company to stick in, on posters in JD Sports? If, if you were walking in there, the Shannon Courtney one's going to get more attention than the Rachel Ball one, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? As a pin-up if you know what I mean, kind of thing. Yeah. So we have to give her credit. She's marketed herself well, but she might just get better as she, go, as she goes along. Who knows? But she obviously likes a little tear-up, doesn't she? Well, Macklin seems to have he's a bit of a glint in his eye for her as well, doesn't he? Matthew Macklin, a.k.a. the new James Bond. Uh, all right, then. What, what, what else... But Tennyson knocked that guy out, didn't he? But he should have done. He should have done that, really, shouldn't he? So, tailor made for him. So, you don't agree with what Johnny said about Tennyson, then? No. I've thought about it long and hard, and uh, I've come to the conclusion I don't agree with Johnny. Yeah. Yeah. All right then. So that that more or less covers it. Dante Dixon won, didn't he? And there were another kid before him. I mean, I said all home fighters had win dinner. I did say that, didn't I? Although the closest 50-50 yeah. fight were the first one, I thought, and he, and he won it, didn't he? So, all Eddie's lot won. Moving on from that, then, what about Eddie's outfit? What do you think to that? Has he lost it? <laughs> it was the whopper. Strutting about in a pair of Gavinci trainers like he owned the place. He probably did own the place. <laughs> But, uh, I thought that the Joshua, I don't know, I thought there were, he was supposed to be at the O2, but they must have moved it to Wembley Arena. Oh, Joshua? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, thought, I, thought, I, I don't know. It's, next, it's Saturday, isn't it, Joshua? It's... Joshua Pulev, yeah, Saturday. Oh, I don't know, but I, I don't want to hear Eddie going on about uh, so Marty Murray can beat Billy Joe Saunders. And don't forget, we're fighting in an empty arena and... You know, and it might—it just might put Billy off and all that. Are we going to hear all that this week with Joshua Pooler? 
with people siding with Pulef and uh, and they're in an empty arena, you know, and Pulef's experience and he's been in with them all. And look, Pulef's forty year old. It, well, it is what it is, isn't it? They're just peeing on his legs, aren't they? That's what they're doing. Who's who's Pulef's best win? Yui Fury. Oh. Slash Dale Boy. Slash Dale Boy. Yeah, that's it. And Yui were cutting round two. So game plan went out window for Peter and Yui. It's one of them things, isn't it? But uh well, boxing, isn't it? So we've covered Eddie's show. We'll now cover Brick Top's show. Pulev's best win was the purse bid, purse bid against Dillian White. Yeah, yeah. All right, then what do you think about Brick Top show? Dennis McCann? I think the kid's a star. I do, I do. I think the kid's a star. I think, I think a, a good next fight for him, I called it about a month ago, would be Carl Williams, a uh, local lad to me, for... Um, Charlie Edwards, not long back, gave Charlie Edwards a very good fight on three weeks' notice. Yeah. I think that'd be a really good fight for Dennis McCann. He wins the world title, him, Dennis McCann, doesn't he? He's I got- think so. I think, he, I th- I think he, does, he looks the real deal to me. Yeah. All right, what about uh, Anthony Yard against Lyndon Arthur? <sighs> what about that? Bit of a stinker for me, really, though. Got that wrong, didn't I? I had Yard to knock him out. I, mean, I thought I don't know what the moaning's about. I thought Lyndon Arthur won the fight. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I mean Ian John Lewis, he had it by six rounds to yard, didn't he? He's always there, isn't he? Ian John Lewis, he's all he, he's always there, Mister Incompetent. I mean, what? Do you know if that if Yard had got that on by a split decision, and Ian John Lewis has carved like that. So if he and John Lewis has got it by six rounds to yard, and other two have got it to Lyndon Arthur, how many rounds is he out? What is he watching? Yet again, controversy, but the right man won. Lyndon Arthur beat him with a jab, didn't he? Yeah, I agree. I thought Lyndon Arthur won the fight. I had, I didn't officially score it, sort of writing it down, but as I was sort of watching it, I was clocking up the rounds of my head, and I think I had it around about 7-5. Yeah. For yeah. Lyndon Arthur. Yeah. But it were a close fight, but Lyndon Arthur for me, and I think Yard's got the gear, so Yard should have won the fight. He didn't put his foot on the gas early enough. No, he didn't, did he? He didn't. And uh, I wonder what will happen there now. Is Yard a free agent now? I think he is, is he? Is he a free agent? Um, I think there was a rematch. I don't know if it was con- contractually obliged whether he has to fulfil it or not. But uh, the chance that, you know, the option's there for a rematch. So I would, have, I would assume that Yard would take that. Well, this is how I look at it now. Yard will be wanting to fight somebody now. Eddie's got a match. Callum Johnson with Anthony Yard now, or Jose Burton and and and, and uh, yeah, Anthony Yard. These fights have got to happen. Boatsy against Yard. Eddie will be begging for that now. He'll be begging for it now. So some him and Bricktop have got to work together. Ills and Bricktop have to work together now because. Where's Anthony Yard go now? Yeah, the, and I think this is the this is the sort of the sticking point now that we're sort of where we're at with boxing now is that those fights should be happening between the three of them. Yeah. Um, you've got Yard, who's probably probably the third best out of the three of them, but he's the biggest name out of the three of them. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, what next for Bricktop? Well, you've had Dubois and Yard beating a week, who were his two big stars, really, were, you know, officially just his exclusively. Um, obviously, I know he's part of Tyson Fury, but t- Tyson Fury's top rank in it. Um, I think in terms of BT Sport, they're face of UK boxing. Um, obviously, it's Dubois and Yard, isn't it? And it has been since BT were involved with Queensbury. Um, and to have them both beat within a week... I think it's, I think it's disaster really. And as you'd put it, Paul, Kate could be uh, on the road to Skid Row. Yeah, uh, 
at least Yard's got a few quid out of the box, and so that's good. But do you feel that Anthony Yard were missing something and that he's not gone through the levels properly? I mean, he's gone from fighting at area level and he's, you he could say, beating English level guys, and then he's got him with Kovalev, got beat, and now he's start, sort of like starting again at that level he should be fighting at. And you feel he's been exposed as just a banger, a one trick pony? That ain't got much to his game, or, or do you think he just had a bad night at office? Uh, good question. Because I do see potential in Yard. I just think that he's too arrogant in the ring for me. He thinks that he's pot shotting and you know he, he, his accuracy is enough to win rounds. But if you if he's not busy enough and he's in, in and he's sort of you know just throwing. 10 to 15 punches around. If they land, fair enough. But if the other guy's throwing, say, 70, 80 punches and he's landing one in five of them, who, who's the judge he's really going to side with? Yeah, what would Clinton Woods have done to Anthony Yard last night? He would have blew him out of there. Yeah. Just like Kovalev did with the job. Yeah, yeah. But I just think that Anthony Yard, he, he has got potential, but as long as he's returned day, I can't see him progressing because the arrogance within that team is holding him back. Tunde's his manager, though, as well, eh? You know, he's, he's, you know, when you get manager trainers, I think there's a bit of a conflict of interest there, isn't there? I, I always think if they, if they train and manage, yeah. But uh, they've, done, they've done well to get a few quid out of the job, but... Well, he's another Adidas guy, you know? He's, yeah, he's got, he's, he's, uh, yeah, it's about profile. He's got a good profile, Anthony Yard, hasn't he? That is massive profile, yeah. I was sold more, I was sold fighters nowadays on the profiles and the hype rather than actual ability. Than in ring achievements, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you've got Joshua at the time, I know he's an Olympic gold medalist, but he was slapped all over Lucas Aid, Lynx, and Dorama. Before yeah. he'd even won anything, really. Yeah. Does Dave Allen come back? Who cares? Yeah. Who I, cares? I want to see him come back and win a British. No chance. No. No, I think no. No chance. Unless, 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 I mean, you've got Joe George, who's the British champion now. You'd expect that he'd probably give the belt up anyway. But... I mean, you'd only have to look at the British heavyweight rankings anyway and think, well, whoever they decide to put him in with, is he, is he good enough to win it anyway? I mean, he got absolutely schooled and battered by David Price. Yeah, what about... And you'd, would you class that as a British-level fight now? I don't know. Not really. Price, he bullied him, didn't he? Uh, that, that. What about uh, Operation Tom Little, 8.5? Does he come back? Again, who cares? Yeah. You know what I mean? He's just... Very capable. He got himself in good shape, but he's just very limited, isn't he? And, he, you know, he seems like a cracking bloke. And um, I just hope that he got paid well enough by the Babbage fight to, to, to sort of sail off into the sunset. Not long term, but, you know, he's made enough money out of the game to not have to think about getting back in there. And, you know, hopefully... He's a bit like Davy Price. He might have a bit of a trade to work with and he can carry on with his life. Yeah. What about uh, Babich? What What next for him? The Savage? Again, I just don't get it. I just don't get it. How old is he? 30. What, what are they expecting to achieve with him? He, he, he's nothing more to me than just a card you know, like a card filler, just a bit of an excitement. They're almost exhibition contests, isn't they? Like the sort of having... of the evening, the savage. What are they going to do? They're going to fucking wheel his aura out and try and slap it on pay per view <laughs> six months down the line or something. Yeah. I don't get where they're going with this. What would Wardley do to uh, the savage? Would beat him up, wouldn't he? I fucking hope so. I don't like this bab babbage at all. No. He's a Dylan White fighter. So, it obviously, Eddie's, Eddie's listening to White, isn't he? So, and White's telling Eddie, that, oh, I've sparred him, he's good, and this and that. And he's knocking people out and bringing entertainment to the ring, isn't he? That's what we do want, don't we? 
Yeah, I suppose so. It's all about the heavyweights, the blue ribbon division. It's great to have it back. Yeah, great to have it back, Johnny. <laughs> yes, please, Bob. <laughs> Black blockbusters, isn't it? Yes, please, Bean. <laughs> um, predictions, anyway, because obviously, you know, uh, I did get the Joe Joyce one correct. Did not said he'd wear him down and stop him. Um, Joshua Pulev, for me, I think Joshua are on points. Yeah. I do. I think it'll be very much the same as, you know, when he fought Parker and when he fought Ruiz the second time. He weren't willing to sort of stand and trade. Not that Pulev poses the same sort of threat as them as them two guys. Um, but I just think that with the carrot of the Tyson Fury fight there for next year, I just can't see Joshua sort of taking any risks. I think that he knows himself. He, he could potentially gas if he goes for a knockout. And if he doesn't get it, he could get stopped himself. I, I just think that he will box on the back foot. He may floor pool left once or twice, but I think he'll just box sensibly on the back foot and pick up a unanimous decision win. Yeah, so you're going for Joshua on back foot on points in a stinker. Yeah, I am. If Joshua doesn't stop Pula for 40 year, 40 year old one two plodder merchant, what does it say about the state of British boxing for, for the heavyweight scene? You know, with all the hype Joshua's had. And... Well, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say anything negative because at the end of the day, the British boxing scene is we've got number one and number two, and we've got all the belts. Yeah. So I wouldn't I, w- I wouldn't start shitting on it. You know, I don't think that's ever been the case in the past, has it? Sort of the fact that we could have two guys fighting together for for all the belts. Do you feel um, that Joshua, the paper and over cracks as regards his ability and that, you know, he's, he's going to have every advantage against pool left, ring size, gloves, hometown ref, or, or it's all going to be stacked against pool left, and he's going to need to knock Joshua out to win, isn't he, basically? And then he's got to fight him again. What do you think about that, Dale? Rematch clause on a mandatory. What's the point of mandatory is if we're in rematch clause? What do you think to that? Um, well, at the end of the day, no one, no, no one's pinning them to the desk and saying you must sign this. Yeah. But at the end of the day, why wouldn't you sign it? Joshua is the biggest cash cow in the division, possibly alongside Tyson Fury. Um, in terms of pay per view and ticket sales, I don't think Joshua could be, um, you know. There's n- there's nobody bigger. I mean, you, know, you could argue Tyson maybe on a par, but why wouldn't you sign a rematch clause anyway? Because even if he wins, he's going to make mega money at the rematch anyway. Yeah, Look the, at Andy Ruiz. There's that. Andy as Ruiz, well. and, and it's Andy Ruiz made out of them two fights, twenty million dollars. Yeah, there's there's that as well. But the whole point of mandatories and voluntaries. A voluntary, if you're in top fifteen and you need a fight and you're champion, you can pick anybody in top fifteen. A mandatory is people who work their way up into that number one position for to be mandatory so that they can beat the champion and then don't have to rematch them and go their own way. So I think the the the, the problem lies with the organisations, you know, the governing bodies that are basically run by promoters, aren't they told what to do, aren't they? It's called lobbying, isn't it? But we all know what goes on. But I just think, it, well, what's the point in having managers if they just got to fight? You've got to beat the champion twice, haven't you, now, nowadays? To keep the belt, yeah, and, and I just think that it takes it away from it, freshening it up. Do you know what I mean? Kind of thing. I don't know. I don't yeah, I mean, I've spoke about rematches before, and you know, the sort of announcing like a two fight deal for Joshua and Fury. And I think I don't usually tend to like these kind of things because it's almost like uh, it almost takes away the gloss from the first fight because it makes you think, well. It doesn't really matter who wins this one because we've got it again next anyway. Yeah. Um, well, I've never really been a fan of them anyway, but I can understand why that why they put them in. Obviously, the Joshua Ruiz one's a perfect example. I know that was a voluntary, but it's just a it's just an insurance policy, isn't it? But again, you you just look from the opponent's perspective, Pula. Why wouldn't you sign it anyway? Because you're not going to earn that kind of money elsewhere anyway. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, then. Uh, media. The the media. Uh, this week, Coogan has had a lot of stick. And this week, we Daniel Dubar, Carry On, and 
all that. What do you make about all that, Dale? Um, well, I'm not going to go into too much detail because I've said my piece in other ways. Things have happened this week. Um, I just would would say that I think that there'd be a lot of people backtracking now after Brick Top on IFL last night when he sort of diagnosed the problem, but he's read out the doctor's notes. And I think that, the, that there's a lot of people within the boxing industry who should be A, ashamed of themselves, and B, should be issuing apologies. And I think that you've got people like Tony Bellew, who, when Chisora quit against Fury in the second fight, when David Price quit against Kuzmin, when Joshua, whether you believe it or not, quit against Ruiz in the first fight. You know, these people, he never had nothing to say, yet he was quick to throw, I never spewed it. My first coach told me never to spew it um, on Monday morning all over Twitter to kick a 23-year-old lad whilst he's down. You've also got the um, people like... Johnny Nelson couldn't wait to get on IFL, start running his mouth off when he stunk out Sheffield Arena for years on end. You know, won a, won a world title by default. There's a lot of people within boxing now who need to take a long, hard look at themselves, including the media, including ex-fighters, including current active fighters. And I think that a lot of people have showed the true colours this week. Uh, people profiting out of, for me, the word quit. It's been branded around too much. There's many forms of quit for me. Um, yes, the war did quit the fight. Yes, he did. He will know that more than anybody else. But I think if there's ever any reason to quit a fight, if ever there's any reason, that would be it. Do you feel that Coogan's caught up in kind of like the middle ground of he knows he has to keep Eddie Earn happy because we have access to that the old stack of cards comes down, doesn't it? What he's built up, and let's have it right. He's put the work in, hasn't he? And he is a good interviewer. And Fantastic he's, interviewer. It's an hard slog, you know that way he does, mate. I've done it myself, mate. I'm like, whoa, it's a proper hard slog all day at it and traveling and all that. But do you feel he's caught in the middle ground here, and that maybe somebody might be saying you need to get get it out there about this and. Is it caught in the middle ground? I wanted to earn a few quid and please certain people. And and it's like in the middle. Do you think it's now bit him in ass? What do you think? I think a lot of people have kind of gone at him a little bit on Twitter this week. Um, Smido being one of them, put up a few sort of tweets the other day and full credit to him. Um, you know, calling out Rob Tebbett, calling out Coogan um, for people sort of, getting everyone on their channels as quick as they possibly could to sort of get their reaction on the fight. And I understand why they've got to do it. I understand why. But my point was, are these guys, your Rob Tebbett, your Coogans, are they putting enough challenge on these people when they're sort of putting criticism onto a young lad? And that was why I sort of got myself a little bit worked up about it. I threw in a few tweets at Coogan. Coogan blocked me. I got into touch with Coogan through another form. Coogan then unblocked me and we had a 30-minute conversation on the phone. And he basically said to me that the way that, the, the way that it works is you've got to go with your strongest headline. I said that, in my opinion, I feel that that's clickbait. He disagreed and said that it wasn't. But if you're going to have a 30-minute interview with somebody... And you're going to pull out the most controversial one line that they say out of that and run that as a headline. How is that not clickbait? It's intense beef, isn't it? Dale and Coogan, or is it raw beef? Was it raw beef? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, it, it, there, was, there was a lot of disagreement within, you know, in, in the conversation. I, I tended to sort of have my views on things. He had his views on things. We know we're leading the charge on Twitter, though, wasn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. Full credit to him. People needed calling out this week. People needed calling out. 
Yeah. And like I say, there's people in boxing now who need to have a good, long, hard look at themselves this week. There's people who need to issue some apologies. And for me, I hope that Daniel Dubois, whatever he chooses to do from now on, hopefully he can continue to box. And if he does, and he goes on to achieve good things and big things in the ring, in this sport, I hope he remembers this. I hope he remembers this and the people who stuck by him and the people who decided to, to do what what they did to O'Hara and throw him under the bus. Yeah, O'Hara got thrown away like garbage, didn't he? By I mean, O'Hara, Dave Allen, they're two fighters that have gone off on IFL and admitted that quit. But they faced, I mean, Dave Allen didn't really get any sort of criticism before it or after it. O'Hara Davies sort of did, but he was he was a villainous sort of character anyway, wasn't he? Dave he was Allen's an easy target not, anyway. He, he's loved, isn't he? So Dave can put a weird twinkle in his eye and get away with it. People can go, oh, it's Dave, isn't it? He, he quit, but we love him anyway. Whereas O'Hara, he rubbed up every he rubbed everybody up the wrong way, didn't he? And then he then he quit in ring, didn't he? Obviously. But I mean, yeah. So, but look who O'Hara has lost to, though. He's only lost to a world class, hasn't he? Yeah, well, he obviously had a bit of a dodgy decision along the way, but he's come back and won this golden contract. Jazza Dickens got beat by Keith Gallagher at a, a domestic level. He's come back, he's won this golden contract as well. So, you know, there's two examples there where you sort of can come back from, from losses early on in your career. You know, look at Dillian White. He got, he got iced at British level. He's come back and, you know, whatever you seem to think of the guy, he has still gone on to achieve good things in the sport and make multi, multi millions out of the sport. Not for you know, being title though, yeah, Dale. But he's still made millions out of the game now, Porker. Still at um, level. Yeah, I see where you're coming from. Yeah, well, if... But like I say, you know, you can lose at British about. level early on and you can come back. It's called prize fighting and you need a prize. You know, belts, they don't pay mortgages, do they, and take you on holiday? No. Prizes do, so, but uh, yeah, it's uh, exciting times ahead, Johnny. This is why we love this sport so much. Rough, tough, rugged, durable, all action, compelling, added spice, sizzling, <laughs> bean. Uh, all right then. Uh, what do you think is going to happen with? Dazone coming to the UK. Do you think that's going to tip it all upside down for Sky? Uh, well, they've got Campbell Goss here, isn't they? they've got um, Canelo Smith. Fights that typically might have landed on Sky. Um, I mean, for me, the price is at one ninety nine a month at the moment, so it's a no-brainer to sort of subscribe at that price anyway, yeah. for £2 a month. So, I will subscribe and we'll sort of see how the content goes from there, really. I mean, we've missed out on, on some good cards from America in the previous few months. Um, I know that um, Premier Sports have sort of got involved, haven't they? And they've sort of picked, started picking out a few of them. But if we can get some broadcasters on board that can, you know, give us British fans all, all sort of worldwide content, then I'm all for it, really. So long as we don't sort of miss out on big cards again. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I think that's about it, really. We'll, we'll we'll do it. We'll cover a little bit about Dennis's show. Uh, Danny Whitaker got knocked out by uh, David Adelaide, so he'll be pulled off the Dennis Hobson show. We're fighting Cash Alley. It's now Sunday morning. Cash ain't got an opponent, and they've got to be in bubble Tuesday. So, do you think Cash Alley fights next Friday, or do you think Dennis parks him up? It's difficult, isn't it? Because you can't exactly just go and pull someone from Poland or Latvia because they can't come into the country. They've got a quarantine for 10 days. Yeah. So it's it's a tough one now, isn't it? Like you say, Tom Little could be your man. Yeah, if I were in charge, it would have all been a sword. You know that, don't you? <laughs> Who I'm knows? Not... Should, I, should, I get a, should I get a pair of shorts out, Paul? Okay. Yeah, I'll get, get, I'll get, get, get up to it. Yeah, yeah. I'll go fight cash myself. Yeah, but if Cash don't fight, I feel for Richard Towers, his trainer, who's they've been they've been at it months getting him in shape and he's trimmed down and everything. He looks looks really well. So you've got a feel for him, haven't you? If if they don't fight, but it's the boxing game, isn't it? It is, but I think just you know, just to touch on that, I think that obviously just this side of Christmas, 
I mean, I don't know sort of how it all works behind the scenes, but I would have imagined that you don't thought you don't get paid. Yeah. So, you know, from that side of things, it'd be it'd be gutting to hear, hear for a fight. I was put the grafting for months on end, three weeks away from Christmas, loses his paycheck. Yeah, he gets looked after anyway. He's, he's, Dennis will see him all right if they don't fight. But I just think that uh, with this pandemic, I, I, I'm wondering when boxing's going to get back to some normality, Dale. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, we've obviously got a 1,000 fans in for the Joshua fight the weekend, um, which in terms of a show like that won't really do a fat lot for it. It'll help to cover a few costs here for her and, Etc. But it's it's like your shows, like your Dennis's, your small all shows. The sooner they can get back on their feet and start getting fans in up to a thousand capacity, uh, then the better for the sport, really. Do you think that Eddie Earn will get them thousand tickets away to NHS, or do you think he'll just do them as VIPs? Oh, I believe that they're on sale. Poor K cheapest ticket, two hundred pound. Two hundred quid. Yeah, that's what I've been hearing. Yeah. Is there any VIPs for sale? The world <laughs> probably uh, to be honest I, I, I only go off what I hear about stuff like that anyway because I don't really look into it because I've no intention of buying them myself anyway alright then what about uh, Errol, Errol Spence we'll cover oh hang on we'll talk about Errol Spence against Garcia what do you think to that uh, a lot of people sort of was having a bit of a bet on Garcia to win the fight just because they weren't sure of how Spence was going to be. He looks sensational to me. He, you know, let's hope that he does, we finally get the Crawford fight next year to see who is number one at the weight class. Yeah. Uh, Garcia now, he's sort of in his latter stages of his career, isn't he? He's, he's, you know, he's been champion at two weights, uh, unified at 140. Um, you know, he's had a good, good stellar career. He sort of now slid into that gatekeeper status now for me. Um, you know, a former champion with a with a big name, decent resume, but he's not got it in him to win a world title again now. Um, so he sort of is in that gatekeeper sort of sort of a area now. Where he goes from here, I don't know. He'll probably sort of fight a prospect in his next fight. I would imagine then then you might sort of see him call it a day. He would have earned his millions, no problem. Um, Spence, yep, yeah, let's hope that we do finally get the Crawford fight next year because they clearly are number one and number two in that weight division and they quite possibly could both be in the top five pound for pound as well. Uh, what about Yui against Wack? How do you see that going? Um, Yui on points. Yui on points. Well, his dad Peter says that you is sitting down on his punches and he's punching like a mule. He's got man strength. What do you think to that? Well, that's all, that, I'll look forward to seeing it then. Yeah. Um, no, you know I don't really want to shit on Huey too much. He, he stepped up and took fights at, at the early age of his career. You know Parker, Povetkin, Pulev. These will stand him in good stead down the line. He'll have learned a lot from them fights. He's never been dropped in a professional ring, you he? And you know what I mean? I mean, it could, would have been easy easy for him out there in Bulgaria or on away territory after suffering a bad cut two rounds into the fight for, for him to spew it and he didn't. He ground it out. Man of, you know, man of pride. Good yeah. luck to him. He and let's see where we can go in the pro game. I like you, I like you. Him against Joe Joyce. Him against Joe Joyce. Yeah, it wouldn't be the most, you know, it wouldn't be the most thrilling a build up. It probably wouldn't be the most thrilling heavyweight fight we've ever seen, but it wouldn't be a fight I wouldn't mind seeing. I think it'd be a well evenly matched fight. And I think for the British Commonwealth and European titles, it, it'd tell a lot about where these guys are at. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dante Wilder, what do you reckon? What's happened to him? Uh, he's embarrassed himself, hasn't he? Has he been smoking that, what Johnny Nelson smokes? The chronic? He's, in, he's, he's, he's embarrassed himself um, quite badly. He's, he's obviously waiting for the uh, the contract to expire. You haven't heard nothing off him for months and months and months. And then the day that the contract expires for the rematch, 
he's all of a sudden coming out with all sorts, isn't he? I mean, the excuses we've heard, you know, the gloves, loaded gloves, the costume, the water. It, it, it's absolutely embarrassing. I think Fury's just mentally broke him, just like he did with Vladimir. I mean, to this day, until this day, Vladimir can't give Fury any credit for the win, can he? Um, and it seems to be the same case with Wilder. I think whatever Tyson Fury seems to be doing to these opponents, he's just mentally breaking them, isn't he? Uh, yeah, there's a lot of hype around Tyson Fury, but he's not defended a world title yet, has he? He hasn't. He hasn't. And that, that, that still stands to be true. To Even today, 2020, on the verge of 2021, Tyson Fury still hasn't defended a world title belt. Yeah. I'm not denying that he's not n- n- the number one um, because he is. He's got the best resume. Um, you know, he might not have sort of the depth of what Joshua is in terms of, when, you know, those B level guys' wins, but his two best wins are better than any of Joshua's wins. Yeah, easily. As Al Eamon parked Tyson Fury up while they at it with this legal dispute. And did Frank Warren's arse fall out when he said he was making Fury Caballero? And then the legal, obviously, issues got involved. Frank doesn't usually back down from legal arguments, does he? So is he parked up and has Frank back down from Heyman and whatnot? I think so. Do you think so? It's looking that way, isn't it? Until, Fra- until somebody like Rob Tebbett or Coogan actually asks the question, Frank, you've never backed down from a fight in your life with legal issues. Why have you pulled the Fury Caballero fight? We- somebody needs to ask that question, don't they, really? I mean, it's getting it's getting a little bit messy beyond the scenes, I think. The only thing I'm hoping that it doesn't affect any potential Fury Joshua fight next year, because... As much as I love this sport, that right now is the only fight I really care about. Well, it's all going to hinge on what happens with Pulev Joshua. If Pulev wins, that's that, that'll be gone because they'll rematch Pulev. If Joshua wins and it's a stinker, Eddie will need Fury Joshua and Frank definitely needs it now because Debar and Yard have been beat, haven't they? Uh, yeah. Frank's in a bit of a pickle at the moment, isn't he, really, when you think about it? You think... I mean, how do you think they'll do it? Do you think it'll be Fury Joshua or Joshua Fury? I don't know. It, it, do think, it's be Fury. Is it going to be on both? Is it going to be on BT and Sky? I don't know, mate. There's that many people involved in it. It should be Fury. He's the he's the man in it everywhere. He should be on the left hand side of the poster. Big Dos of Femi on rise. You know what I mean? That's how I look at it. You. Yeah, I'll, I'll tend to agree with that. Yeah. But, uh, like I said, it's exciting times ahead. This is why we love the sport so much, Johnny. Yeah, all right then. Well, I think we've covered everything there, haven't we? Oh, Errol Spence, did we speak about that? Beat Garcia, we said that had happened, didn't we, on points? Yeah. He yeah. kept saying, oh, Porky, we don't know how Errol Spence is going to react after his car crashed a year ago. Yeah, but look, He's just done a 12 week camp and he'll have gone through all rigors that world champions go through for camp. Full camp completed it, looked fit as a butcher's dog. And he's completed all his sparring and he's ticked every box for check weigh-ins and he's signed off on the medical to go in the ring. So why are people still saying they don't know how he's going to react? What what planet are these people on? He's just done it. the hardest part about being a world champion is not the actual fight. It's the camp, because the, the, the harder the camp is, the easier the fight on the night. So he's got through the camp. Now, that, that should be enough for people to say, well, he's done the camp. You see where I'm coming from? Yeah. But that's how I look at it anyway. I don't know what, what the Porky followers think, what the boxing fans think. You'll have to let me know in the comments section after liking and subscribing and sharing the video, won't you? Hey. <laughs> All right, then. Well, listen, I'm going to get off because me and Rocky, say hello, Rocky. We, me and Rocky are the John and Yoko of South Yorkshire today. So we're not budging out of this bed, are we, Rocky? <laughs> Shout out, Innovation Alloys, South Yorkshire Packaging. 
So you just have, mate. You just have, mate. You know, don't you? You know. We're doing it properly. <laughs> <laughs> I might even not put any videos out today and just put these out Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday and just get them to put intros on because them intros are popular now, aren't they, what we're doing? You want That's intro looking great. You want intro up front to this, Dale, and, and ending? Oh, yeah. The endings are, good, are better than intro, intro, I think. But, yeah, what we'll do then, I'll, I'll just press a button in a minute and just send this to, to them and let them do messing about with it. Saves me messing about today, doing it on the computer. I'm trying to get some kip. We've got two more interviews to do. Can't be arsed today. You know, you know if you've, you've had a bit of a party at home, watching boxing all night. You just don't feel like doing that on a Sunday, do you? I, just... no, I won't be doing much today, mate, other than, you know, just chilling, chilling out, wrapping some Christmas presents and then uh, be watching the match tonight. We've got Liverpool away. Yeah. I was like that last night watching boxing. What was that noise? What was that noise, Rocky? Did you hear something? I kept hearing things last night. I've got super x-ray hearing in the middle of the night. What was that? What was that noise? <laughs> Well, I'm only joking, but yeah, it's been emotional, Dale, but thanks for coming on. You're still the voice of pay-per-view boxing. I'm going to try and get uh, Adam Smith Smidow on, the voice of uh, Hardcore Darts. We'll try and get him on. He's, opinion he's an opinionated uh, guy. The yeah, uh, Adam Smidow Smith, the, vo the voice of Hardcore Darts, the voice of casual boxing, the voice of Hardcore Horse Racing. Yeah, yeah. Hey, hey, yeah, Smidow's jack of all trades, isn't he? Tell uh, Porky followers about how you met Smidio. Go on. Oh, God. Okay, so it's about you know, it was nine years ago now. We uh, Basically, it was on uh, the Monday morning. I went into work, and uh, one of my mates at work said, I've got two tickets to Hay Klitschko on Saturday, um, but I can't go. I've got, I've got to go to a wedding. Um, before I send them back for a refund, do you want them? So... Uh, <clears throat> I just rang up one of my mates straight away and I said, that's fucking hell, man. I said, my mate's got two tickets to I I could go on Saturday. I said, uh, have a quick look online, see if you can get us a couple of cheap flights over there. He goes, uh, he goes oh, before I commit to buying the tickets, he said, oh, go on. So anyway, he rings me back half hour later. He said, oh, the cheapest flight's 600 quid and that's only to Bremen. I said, oh, fucking hell. I said, uh, I said, fuck it, should we drive there? He said, no, nah, I ain't driving there. I want to go on the session all weekend. And I'm like, fucking hell. Um, I said, all right. And so anyway, we had a little look online that we found this this company going uh, driving a minibus <laughs> to Hamburg, 120 quid each return, ferry ferry included, ferry included. So uh, picked up from Birmingham, and I said, uh, so should we do it then? So we fuck it, go on then. So anyway, we got picked up on the Friday, round about round about three o'clock in the afternoon from Birmingham. And uh, just me and my mate, and it was these two dodgy lads driving a minibus. And um, there was obviously, they obviously sold these tickets for this minibus, and there was like a few other people involved. And it was uh, two of the lads that was on the minibus with us, was Smido and his mate. So obviously, we was on this fucking road trip to Hamburg from Birmingham, fucking four day round trip on a minibus all weekend. And um, <clears throat> that's how we ended up like meeting him and getting, getting to know him and that. And we've just stayed in touch ever since. God, right, right, bromance, isn't it? Bromance. So what what were all minibus carry on then, did you? Were well, you were asleep at minibus on the way back? Oh, me and my mate had the case of beers in the back and just drank them the old way there. Did you? And what was Smith yeah. sleeping? I can't remember to be honest. Did it take long in minibus, a long drive? Uh we left about three o'clock on the Friday, managed to get, I think, to our hotel. It was around about eight o'clock the next morning. What was it? Fury Vladimir? Right. No, hi, hi Vladimir. Hey, Vladimir. Yeah, yeah. Tollgate. <laughs> Tollgate, that's it, yeah. That's Fucking that's ridiculous. That. Absolutely pissed on. The worst rainstorm I've ever known in my entire life. Caught up in it all, and it was a dog shit fight. Yeah. He fought in a pair of... Uh... Azak trainers, didn't it? Azak's trainers, didn't it, David Day that night? Do you remember? Yeah, I remember, yeah. I remember. But it was a cracking weekend anyway. Don't remember much of it, but yeah, it was a so, class weekend. It came through to me and Dennis were having having a session in library. 
and uh, Smitty all came through for a bit of lunch and in, in the, he didn't have a beer. <laughs> you had pop or something. Me and Dennis were there, we were proper necking them back, but uh, I think we did, me and Smitty all did a video in uh, in restaurant part and he looked all proper smart and that, shirt and tie on and all that and nice little car outside he had and proper little uh, young kid doing well for his son. So... Good luck to him. I like Smith though. He's a he's an opinionator. He's not afraid to stick it to you. He sticks it to me every other day. He's my biggest critic. <laughs> he's probably the voice of our poor dart. Shout out to all the asylum lads, uh, yeah, Steve I'm Welling as well. They do they do right, a smashing job every Sunday. Smashing job. Big shout out to Rico and Terry as well. The beautiful boxing podcast. Google that. It's on Spotify and. Rico's uh, co-founder of Pork is Corner. They're good boxing blokes. All right, then. Well, I'll leave you with this then. Has social media killed boxing, Dale? Killed it? I don't know. Changed the face of it, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. All right, then. All right, then. Well, listen, you take care, and I will speak to you later. All right, my friend. Peace out. See you, Dale. See you later. Well, that was Dale Nichols, a.k.a. the voice of pay-per-view boxing from Wolverhampton. He's a Wolves fan, so I'm a Liverpool fan, so let's hope that Liverpool stick it to Wolves tonight. But at the moment, I'm uh, shattered, so I'm going to try and get a bit of kit before next interview, so... Peace out. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you like the introduction and the ending.